Hello and welcome to our program. The leaders of North Korea and the United States met at the Boro village of Panmunjom, a decades-old symbol of division and animosity. This historic meeting came four months after the summit breakdown in Hanoi. What do both sides do in order to keep the dialogue momentum alive? This is a topic we're going to examine on this week's Peace and Prosperity. The surprise meeting between the leaders of the two Koreas and the U.S. at Panmunjom came just 32 hours after U.S. President Donald Trump's tweet. It all began with an invitation Trump issued over Twitter in the morning of June 29th. A few hours ahead of his trip to Seoul, the U.S. President tweeted he'd be willing to meet with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un at the DMZ. At the G20 summit, Trump reportedly spoke about his suite with President Moon Jae-in and told him they'll work together to make it happen. In response to Trump's sudden proposal, North Korea's first vice foreign minister, Choi Sun-hee, said, it's a very interesting suggestion in a statement released through the Korean Central News Agency roughly five hours after the tweet. Upon confirming the two leaders' willingness to meet, the U.S. communicated with North Korea through a direct hotline between the U.N. command and the North Korean military. The North immediately responded, and Stephen Began, U.S. Special Representative for North Korea, met with North Korean officials at Panmunjom on the evening of June 29th to arrange Kim and Trump's surprise encounter. During a brief joint presser following the South Korea-U.S. summit, President Moon announced the leaders of North Korea and the U.S. would be meeting at Panmunjom. At 3.46 p.m. local time on June 30th, Kim and Trump walked up the military demarcation line by sectioning the two Koreas and shook hands. Five minutes later, in an historic moment, the leaders of the two Koreas and the U.S. finally all met together. A diplomatic production that began with an impromptu tweet made history, leading to a landmark meeting at the truest village of Panmunjom. For today's discussion, we are joined by Professor Park won -gwon, Professor in International Studies at Handong Global University. Welcome. Thanks for having me here. Okay, I have a lot of questions, but let's mm -hmm. begin with a simple, straight question. My mm -hmm. first question is, how do you assess the historic meeting? between um, U.S. President Donald Trump and Chairman Kim Jong-un of North Korea at Panmunjom? I think this is definitely a third summit between DPRK and So United it's not States. just a simple meeting, but third summit meeting, yes, right? I It's don't qualified think... as a third summit meeting between the two countries. Yes, because although I don't think they have uh, any pre-planned one, mm -hmm. but they uh, have talked more than 53 minutes. So definitely I think this is third summit between DPRK and United States. Does it mean that uh, it was not a really impromptu meeting, which happened to be extended for 53 minutes, but uh, it, was that original scheduled to be such a substantial, long summit meeting between U.S. and DPR? I don't think so. Nobody no? expects that it lasts 53 minutes. Many people, including me, we expect that they just have a handshake and a photo op in the Panmunjom. So I, also, President Trump mentioned a couple of days ago he has a plan to meet Chairman Kim Jong-un around two minutes. Mm -hmm. So everybody expects that kind of a meeting is going to be held at the Panmunjom. So what do they gain and what do they lose? I mean, Trump seems to gain a lot mm -hmm. in terms of domestic politics. I can understand the point, but you can elaborate on that point. And what did Chairman Kim Jong-un gain? Well, both of them actually gained a lot. So even CNN said that uh, Trump's political win. Yeah, I agree with that because 
after the break of, breakdown of the Hanoi summit in February, and Donald Trump and his administration got lots of criticism because still it is true that North Korea has the, developed their nuclear and missile program. They haven't freezed the old program. Um, from the North Korean perspective, and Chairman Kim Jong Un, and he also had a very difficult position after the uh, Hanoi summit, mm -hmm. and so. He decided to bring the Xi Jinping of the uh, Chinese president, and also he wanted to talk the president, the Kim, uh, President Trump. So this time, actually, after the, the day after this actual summit at Panmunjom, the Nodong Shimun, the official uh, newspaper of North Korea, and it very clearly mentioned that Donald Trump asked and he came to Korean Peninsula in order to meet Kim Jong-un. So it's a very good propaganda for right, the North right. Korean regime itself. See, he has a, some kind of a damage during this Hanoi summit. He's, I, I think, totally recovered because he not only met uh, Xi Jinping, but also met the Trump. Both of them are the superpowers leader. History was made at Panmunjom on June 30th as the leaders of both Korea and the United States got together on the Korean Peninsula. We'll hear key remarks from each of them before continuing on with our discussion. 트럼프 대통령님이야말로 한반도 평화 프로세스의 주인공, 한반도의 피스메이커입니다. 이 트럼프 대통령께서 분리선을 넘어서 다시는 다시 말하면 그 같이 하는 그 과거를 청산하고 앞으로 좋은 남나를 개척하려는 트럼프 대통령의 그. Mario, I just want to say that uh, this is my honor. I didn't really expect it. We were in Japan for the G20. We came over and I said, hey, I'm over here. I want to call Chairman Kim. And we got to meet and uh, stepping across that line was a great honor. A lot of progress has been made. All right, we uh, made this point that China was conspicuously absent in these dynamics, but uh, leader that was emerging as a key player in this dynamics must have been President uh, Moon Jae-in of South Korea. How do you assess the role or contribution of South Korean government to this uh, third summit meeting between U.S. and North Korea? Well, our President Moon Jae-in, he actually has played a very important role. There is no doubt at all because although North Korea has criticized and blamed the South Korean government, even in some sense, the President Moon Jae-in himself after the break of, breakdown of the Hanoi summit. Right. But still, our president and our government has maintained the position to open the dialogue channel to North Korea. And at the same time, I strongly believe that when we have uh, this round of this deep U U.S. and South Korea's summit at the uh, couple of days ago, I think our president has strongly encouraged the Donald Trump to have a direct dialogue with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. So uh, it's no doubt that how the president Moon Jae-in has played the important role. The leaders of the two Koreas in the United States successfully laid the groundworks for possible breakthrough nuclear dialogue. Many experts agree that now is the time. Now is the time to focus on the specifics in negotiations. What challenges are lying ahead? Let's watch a short clip first. North Korean media outlets quickly reported the impromptu Kim Trump meeting at the GMZ on June 30th. 1953년 정전 협정 이후 66년 만에 정의 두 나라 최고 순위분들께서 분단의 상징이었던 반문점에서 서로 손을 마주 잡고 역사적인 악수를 하는 놀라운 현실이 펼쳐졌습니다. Amid renewed expectations for a breakthrough in denuclearization talks, Trump invited the North Korean leader to the White House, raising hopes of a possible North Korea U.S. summit in Washington. Attention is turning to the officials from Pyongyang and Washington involved in the latest DMZ meeting as they are likely to lead working-level talks that will start in a few weeks. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, U.S. Special Representative for North Korea Stephen Began will continue to represent Washington. Began has reportedly called for dialogue and advocated a flexible approach with the North. 
Following his one-on-one -on -one meeting with Kim, Trump said both sides agreed to resume working-level talks, adding Pompeo's still in charge of the U.S. team would begin leading negotiations. Under the auspices of our great Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, and what's going to happen is over the next two or three weeks, the teams are going to start working to see whether or not they can do something. Meanwhile, senior officials from Pyongyang's Foreign Affairs Ministry worked closely with Kim for the DMZ meeting. In particular, First Vice Foreign Minister Choi sun hee has been a leading figure in the North's U.S. diplomacy. For the upcoming working-level talks, Pompeo's counterpart is highly likely to be the North's Foreign Minister Ri yong ho and Beigan's Kim myung yun the North's former ambassador to Vietnam. It will be interesting to watch whether working-level negotiations between North Korea and the U.S. with a new line of negotiators will bring fruitful results. Uh, let's just uh, assume that there will be um, working-level negotiations taking place. Then what will be the specifics that must be discussed and uh, negotiated? Well, that's, I think, the most important point. I I think still United States and North Korea, they have a two very different position about the nuclearization progress itself. And they are showing their very clear position during the Hanoi summit, and they still maintain this kind of position. Although the United States a little bit changed, it seems to me they are begging before the Hanoi. The special representative Steve Began mentioned the, this year, January, at the Stanford, and he made a very detailed speech about United States, the proposal of the nuclearization. Yes, we are going to say, we, people are naming that as kind of an in parallel and simultaneous right, approach. Right. But during the Hanoi summit, United States kind of uh, demand the so-called all-in-one or big deal approach. It's a little bit different. But within like three or four weeks ago, the United States and State Department and Special Representative Vegan, they uh, re-talk, re-state about this so-called in parallel and simultaneous approach. So there is a possibility that the, I'm not as sure at this moment the, how they can have a, some kind of compromise of this approach between United States and DPRK because still North Korea, they haven't changed their position at all. They are keep saying that they want to have a phased and also simultaneous step-by-step -step approach. So we will see. So uh, it, it has been reported that the North Korean government uh, mm -hmm. would change the lineup mm -hmm. of the negotiators mm -hmm. uh, from people uh, like Kim young chul and his entourage to people in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Mm -hmm. Would it make a significant change? Yeah, I think so. The United States, they do not want to talk with Kim young chul because mm -hmm. he has a, such a stubborn position. And he keeps saying that he could not decide anything. All this very sensitive issue of denuclearization is depend on the, their dear leader and their, the chairman, Kim Jong-un. So it's very difficult to, to have a, the, any meaningful talk with Kim young chul And also, Kim young chul is not an expert on this denuclearization itself. He's a former military general right. and he's uh, mainly dealing with South Korean issue. So if North Korea decided to bring this issue to the Ministry of the Foreign Affairs. They are Lee Yong ho and the Minister of Foreign Affairs, and also Choi sun yi first Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs. So both of them are very good. I mean, they really have expert, expertise on this issue. So if North Korea decided to have a, a really meaningful, kind, some kind of a roadmap and how to resolve this very lingering and outstanding issue, those two are the main figures that actually come up with some kind of solution. Okay, we'll be paying attention to those two yes, specific but figures. But another problem the is like a special represent Beacon. Mm. He usually North Korea when they have a negotiation <laughs> with another country, not only United States but South Korea, they think about this rank. But Chesoni is becoming very high official, okay, high figure right. at this moment. So North Korea is thinking that Steve Vigon is not the partner counterpart of the Chesoni at this moment. All right, good. North Korea's state media was quick to cover the Kim Trump meeting at DMZ, which demonstrates the country's commitment to dialogue. What can Pyongyang and Washington do in order to ensure their dialogue produce result? We sat down with Moon Jong-in, a special advisor for unification, diplomacy, and national security affairs for President Moon Jae-in. What North Korea does want, North Korea does want two things. One, sanction, you know, 
relief, second, security assurance. If the you, you U.S. cannot give a such incentive as a sanction relief, then the United States should come up with ideas on security assurance. Security assurance has a political dimension, such as exchange of liaison office and to permit normalization. And also it has a military dimension, such as a signing of some sort of non-aggression in the pact. Maybe if the United States can, can come up with that kind of security assurance proposal at the beginning, then there could be a you know, breakthrough. If, of course, in return, the, the North Korea should come up with uh, you know, near complete you know, denuclearization. If that happens, then sanction relief will be automatic. Okay. But if we just pound on the sanction relief, which the U.S. would not accept, then there will be no way out. I personally find uh, advisor Moon Jong-in's point very interesting. Uh, North Korea should not be obsessed with sanction reliefs, but should take into account seriously security guarantees provided by the United States as a first step. Uh, what do you think of uh, Professor Moon's opinion to bring in security assurance in the whole equation of negotiation? Well, after the Hanoi, North Korea already got begun, but to start to talk about the security assurance and security guarantee instead of the lifting of the economic sanction. And Lee Yong-ho, right after the Hanoi, uh, and he mentioned that he will, it's kind of a, you know, the next round, North Korea wanted to have a security guarantee and assurance from North Korea. And also April 12th, the chairman Kim Jong-un's speech, mm -hmm. he also mentioned that no longer you know, North Korea wanted to have a, the lifting of the sanction and instead, North Korea wanted to have a security guarantee. And also, the uh, April, when uh, Chairman Kim Jong-un met the President Putin, and President Putin mentioned that North Korea wanted to have a security guarantee. And also, the very the couple of weeks ago, when the Chairman Kim Jong-un met Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping said a very similar thing. So I believe that security assurance and guarantee is going to be another very important issue for upcoming the working level talk between DPRK and the United States. And also from the uh, United States perspective, especially the Donald Trump's the administration, the security issue is uh, easier to right. deal by the, the administration than the uh, sanction itself, because sanction is cl closely related to the US Congress. And actually, U.S. Congress is responsible for this all the uh, sanction-related issue. So, for you know that it is true that in some sense, United States is, should give us some kind of a corresponding measure if North Korea really do some kind of meaningful denuclearization action activities. All right. Great. President Trump prefers a top-down approach in nuclear dialogue with North Korea, but is the U.S. public on the same page? To shed light on this issue, we'll connect with Mike O'Hellon, a senior fellow at Washington-based think tank, the Brookings Institution. Hello. Hi, nice to be with you today. What should President Trump demand and concede in future negotiations with Chairman Kim? Well, you know, there have been reports the last day or two which we do not have confirmation about. But nonetheless, there have been reports that the Trump administration is considering a partial deal or an interim deal, which presumably uh, South Korea would be part of as well, I hope, which would essentially end the production of North Korean nuclear materials and weapons in exchange for a partial lifting of sanctions. And this is the kind of deal I've been in favor of for a long time. I think it's the most realistic approach it would prevent the North Korean arsenal from growing or modernizing if it also included permanent bans on testing. And it would allow North Korea to regain some degree of economic interaction, especially with South Korea and China. I think the way to do it would be to lift some of the recent UN sanctions, but keep the US sanctions in place since North Korea would be keeping its nuclear bombs for the foreseeable future. And so to me, that's a good compromise. It's a good start. It might be the farthest we get with North Korea for a long time because I don't really think the North Koreans want to give up their bombs, but perhaps they've decided that they have enough and perhaps someday we could talk to them about a completely denuclearized Korean peninsula. I just think it's going to take a while to get to that point. 
So this strategy to me makes sense. And uh, I hope that it's truly one that the various leaders in Seoul, Pyongyang and Washington can pursue. And we'll have to see. Well, it might be too early to ask you this question a few days after the third summit meeting between Trump and Kim. But what are the chances of Kim and Trump meeting again, uh, probably in Washington? When do you expect the fourth possible summit meeting between Kim and Trump will happen? You know, I think a Kim and Trump meeting in Washington would have to be part of an actual deal. We're not ready for that. We need something real, not just nice atmospherics, but an actual deal. And frankly, the kind of interim deal that I'm talking about is probably uh, the minimal requirement for a Kim Jong-un visit. If anything, we should probably do that deal and then wait a while and maybe have him come, you know, after President Trump perhaps is reelected uh, rather than rush the visit. Because, again, Kim Jong-un is really not a great person or leader. And even if we find a way to uh, limit nuclear danger and the risk of war, with him and find some way to improve the diplomatic atmospherics. I don't really think that we should be treating him like a special person just yet. All right. Well, uh, thank you for your time and expertise, Mike. We appreciate it. You listen to Michael O'Hanlon at Brookings Institution. Do you agree with what he said? Well, he raised a very interesting point. But, well, in a sense, not only American people is not ready to accept Chairman Kim Jong-un, but I kind of doubt that North Korean people are also ready to send their Chairman Kim to Washington, D.C. Why, not? Why because, not? Because we all know that North Korea and United States has maintained this arch enemy and hostility more than almost seven decades. But there is a Korean saying that in order mm. to catch a tiger, you have to go into the tiger's cave. Yes, exactly, but without any kind of, uh, you know, pre- and they need something to do that because the whole the North Korea very in very early age mm. they learned about how terrible United States is okay. so right. in order to kind of uh, you know this shock probably very huge surprise for the North Korea they gotta do something I mean regime of the Pyongyang gotta do something something means a new propaganda New propaganda. To change the image of the United States even slightly? More, more important, the most important thing is that if they are entering, I mean, DPRK, United States, entering in the pro process to normalization of the relationship between these two countries, in order to have that, first, as a president, uh, the, uh, Professor Moon jong mentioned that, probably have an establishment of a liaison office and mm -hmm. those kind of things. I mean, okay. if that is need some progress, need some time. It seems like to uh, suggest a kind of step-by-step -step arrangement before yes. mm -hmm. top leader going to Washington. Yes, and also uh, prior to visit Washington, probably some of the lifting of the sanctions, that means the foreign investment and we have uh, some kind of normal exchange and you know, North Korea can, uh, you know, inv can inv invite many foreigners and those kind of things first to happen. All right, all right. All right, Professor Park, uh, thank you so much for sharing your expertise on such a broad range of topics, especially in the immediate aftermath of the dramatic mm -hmm. in a third summit meeting between Trump and Kim. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. What a dramatic weekend. We are seeing a lot of news coverage about working level negotiations between Pyongyang and Washington. Here are the latest news updates. Media reports say North Korea has picked its former ambassador to Vietnam, Kim Myung-gil, as its new chief nuclear envoy. He will be the counterpart of the U.S. Special Representative for North Korea, Stephen Began. The reports say Kim Myung-gil is replacing the North Special Representative for U.S. Affairs, Kim yong tol who led working-level negotiations in February and was reportedly executed in March in a purge after the Hanoi summit resulted in a deadlock. In an interview Wednesday with Radio Free Asia, senior foreign leadership analyst Ken Goss with the Washington-based CNA Analysis and Solutions said Kim myung gil would be the right person to lead the new talks given his experience and rank. Kim myung gil was formerly deputy chief of North Korea's mission to the United Nations in New York and has participated in the six-party denuclearization talks. 
Most recently, he served as ambassador to Vietnam for three years and eight months, including when the Hanoi summit was held in February. Kim myung gae returned to Pyongyang in April after finishing his term. There had been speculation that first vice foreign minister Choi Son yi might serve as Began's counterpart, but Goss said that's unlikely considering that she outranks Began. Instead, Che will likely wield her influence behind the scenes tasked with coming up with strategies for the talks. Based on this, the experts said it seems the North has reorganized its negotiating team around Che's foreign ministry, rather than the United Front Department, the agency that handles inter-Korean affairs and had led the U.S. talks before. Citing a diplomatic source, multiple media outlets in South Korea report that Pyongyang may have informed Washington about its new working level team last Sunday, the day of their leader's landmark encounter at the demilitarized zone. We will discuss more on this matter next week. And that's all we have for you today. Thanks for watching.